Good, then. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. I'm Betsy Peck Learned, Dean of University Library Services at Roger Williams University, and I'd like to welcome you all to our Talking in the Library event. This program is our second library collaboration with the Scholars at Risk Network, and we're so grateful for their partnership. The Library's Talking in the Library series is supported by an endowment to the library by an alumna of the university, Mary Tuft White. This timely program tonight is entitled Ukraine, Reflections from Home and Abroad, and will feature a, a panel of two scholars, Liz Shepantilnikova and Olena Tanchik, along with our moderator, Professor Adam Braver. Adam is the Library Program Director at RWU, a professor of creative writing, and also coordinator of student advocacy seminars with Scholars at Risk. I would be remiss if I didn't recognize Adam's great work with Scholars at Risk that has fostered student advocacy programs across the world, as well as programs such as this one tonight. Professor Braver will now introduce our speakers. Thank you and please enjoy the program. All right, thank you everybody. Thank you, Betsy, and thank you, you um, all for coming. Let me just get our speakers up, up here as well. Um, so I really wanna just get started um, at this point because we have a lot to talk to, to talk about. And, uh, and I really wanna thank Liz and Elena for, for, for being here. Um, you know, for most of us in, in the West, this is, you know, a, a horrifying story that that we're trying to follow and understand. Um, but of course, this is your life. Um, and, and I'm incredibly grateful that you're willing to share your thoughts and perspectives and experiences. Um, and in particular, how you believe the higher education community can and, and perhaps should respond. Um, for those of you um, who are attending, um, um, Liz and Elena will um, get, uh, talk a little bit about themselves. Um, um, present um, some of their experiences and their background and perspectives. Um, talk a little bit about um, again what the higher education, how the higher education community can respond, and then we'll reserve at least you know at least a half an hour for, for questions um, from all of you um, for the for the second part of the program. Um, I do ask, um, we do ask that you uh, put questions in the Q and A, um, and my colleague um, from. Uh, Claire Robinson, the uh, Director of Advocacy at Scholars at Risk, and I will uh, monitor the questions and make sure that they get to Elena and Liz. So with that in mind, Liz, do you, would you like to start and, you know, again, um, you know, some of your background and, um, um, and your perspectives on, on what's happening as well? Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much, Adam and Betsy and Claire for this opportunity to speak today on the topic that is, of course, particularly close to our hearts as uh, uh, we come from Ukraine and have been affected by war in a variety of different ways. Uh, I'm currently in an early career researcher doing my PhD at the University of Hong Kong, where my research area is really focused on academic profession in post-Soviet states. So uh, a lot of issues that uh, we will be discussing today for me are not only personal, but also professional in a sense. Um, I have been working with academic community for over 10 years as um, I started basically as a student activist in 2008. And now since 2014, I have been fortunate to have an opportunity to engage with the Scholars at Risk Network because in 2014, after the Euromaidan revolution, when Russia first attacked Ukraine by annexing Crimea and attacking institutions in the Eastern region of Ukraine, we have started working on gathering information about the tax on higher education and violations of academic freedom. This work now obviously continues as the conflict has moved into the direct confrontation that nobody has seen on the European continent for quite a long time. 
So these dates, um, I'm also grateful to the scholars at Trust because they are the ones who helped me to evacuate from the Ukraine when the war has started. Um, as I've mentioned, post-Soviet academic profession is my area of research. So I was physically in Ukraine when the war broke out, uh, doing data collection. And unfortunately, uh, we had to leave under the circumstances uh, to find a safe place. Uh, I think what is important uh, to understand about my background, in addition to my professional experience, is also uh, my personal connection to what has been going on. Because I was originally born and raised in Eastern Ukraine, a town which is now unfortunately under the Russian occupation. Um, my parents had to flee it and it took them quite a while, of course, because of the shelling that has been continuously going on. So you could say that, I guess, uh, you know, in the in general uh, Russian narrative, I'm probably one of those that they came to rescue from uh, Ukrainian government, uh, although nobody has asked them to do this. And uh, for over 15 years, as I've lived in Kyiv, in the capital of Ukraine, uh, my involvement with both Ukrainian academia and Ukrainian government at a variety of different levels um, has shown that there is a lot of courage and a lot of interest among Ukrainian people uh, to develop, to engage with the West, and to build our own democratic state. Um, I think that one of the things that this war has now shown us uh, is really that um, a lot of people will have to sacrifice themselves for their values. But we want to make sure that we're heard um, and that our voices are not silenced by force. Liz, can you talk a, a moment about your work that you did in 2014 as a student activist and, and the, maybe the line to where things are right now? Or did we lose you for a second, Liz? I think, I think uh, Liz is frozen for a second. Elena, do you want to jump in and... Yeah, absolutely. So I hope that Liz will come back to us in a second. So yeah, so hi, everyone. My name is Olena Tanchik. Thank you very much for inviting me today to be a panelist and uh, to uh, have an opportunity to voice my message and to share my experience, my thoughts, uh, some of my ideas, how we can proceed with the war and uh, um, what we can do as an academia and as the world scientific community. Um, I have prepared a, a short uh, presentation kind of a slide is not going to be a lecture, but I want to um, give a little bit of a background for everything that was uh, going on and has been going on for the last eight years in Ukraine with universities. Yeah, we are not going to specifically speak about only conflict and military um, uh, military things, but our goal for today is to focus on academia, to focus on universities, and for those of you who probably have not um, had a lot of experience with Ukrainian uh, community scholars and scientists. I hope that um, you will have a bigger picture of everything what is going on and while we are waiting for this to join so probably I will fill this gap um, while we are waiting on her. So once again my name is Elena Tanchik and uh, first of all I would say that uh, I'm Ukrainian. Yeah so that's 
for me now an important identity. Uh, I hold my PhD in economics, but I use my minor as my source of income. My minor is in English. I can also add uh, that my uh, identity now is an IDP. And uh, before February 24, this stood for an internal displaced person. So this is such a category of uh, people in Ukraine. But uh, um, after uh, February 24, I would consider myself international displaced person because now I'm in Arizona and I have been here since August uh, doing my research as a Fulbright scholar on special education. So that's why now IDP can be not only internally but um, international displaced person. Um, literally like I am homeless nowadays, cityless but definitely not hopeless. And what I know for sure is that I am a Ukrainian educator and they didn't call on anyone to liberate me, my land, neither in 2014 nor in 2022. So um, today I'm working, or currently I'm working as an English language teacher for about 10 years. And most people in my field get used to writing lesson plans right? So probably educators will now understand me. So today I would like to build a little bit my uh, conversation, my, my uh, presentation, if you uh, want to, uh, to call it, uh, as a lesson plan discussion, okay? And usually um, a teacher starts uh, um, her uh, class with objectives. So, so today during our conversation, yes, we will formulate some important historical questions for displaced universities in 2014. Yeah, well, I would like to articulate for you some events of displaced universities in 2014 and employ multiple forms of evidence and historical arguments in a modern setting. And usually, as I have already mentioned, yeah, we start with objectives and we transit to warm up and to warm up activities. So you can see the map, and just for you to understand that uh, uh, back in 2014, um, Lugansk and Donetsk. So these are two regions. Uh, um, peacefully we're working, um, we educators were doing our activities and, and then um, in one day everything changed and 18 universities uh, started thinking how to relocate their activities and how to continue their activities being under Ukrainian umbrella. So the map demonstrated the relocation of displaced universities. However, no single map can give us a sense of the risk taken and the drama involved in this uh, exodus from Eastern Europe. Um, so as Probably most of you know that uh, our armed conflict uh, broke out uh, in 2013-2014 academic year when students were preparing to uh, their final exams and we had lots of issues how to organize all those activities uh, um, in, the, the, in, the, in the Donetsk and Lugansk regions. Uh, um, so you can see that after that... Um, events in uh, 2014, local melees turned into full-scale hostilities. And because of the referendum that was held uh, in the areas controlled by separatist forces on independence for the two self-proclaimed republics, this so the two so-called uh, the Nietzsche People's Republic and Luhansk People's Republic were formed. And we may see that even nowadays and back in the day, so there was a lot of like Russian propaganda uh, for uh, and that I happen to be in this situation and this happened to be in this situation. So because we are both from Eastern part, Liz is from Starobilsk and I'm from Donetsk. Yes, yeah, so we experienced all these atrocities and we heard uh, how propaganda worked. And uh, we spoke to students and colleagues from both sides on the divide. And many of them talked about increasing mutual intolerance and alienation among people living in the conflict zone. And most of them saw war, poverty, looting, and the systematic degradation of the social and humanitarian institutions and propaganda from both sides, as I have mentioned. Moving on, uh, a teacher usually 
uh, from warming up activities goes to instruct and model. So I'm not going to speak a lot. Yeah, I'm not going to now give you the lecture about that. So, and I'm not going to instruct you, but just for you to um, understand that uh, during the unrest, uh, sometimes referred to as the Russian spring, uh, supporters of independence of the so-called DPR and the uh, LPR seized the administrative buildings and offices of not only the Ukrainian special services, but also civil establishments and universities. So that is how, um, th that is why the universities have had to relocate their activities and they kind of split. Uh, yeah, so some of them stayed in Donetsk and Lugansk, but um, other people were not supporting the, uh, re the new proclaimed regime. Uh, Ukrainian government arranged uh, for university teachers uh, to transfer to different uh, places in Ukraine, but as we understand, some prefer to stay in Donetsk and Lugansk. And in November 2014, Ukraine's National Security Council decided to evacuate all the government bodies and banks out of Donbass. And by that point, the breakup of the universities was more or less complete, and the like, key positions uh, were occupied by people loyal to the separatists, and teaching staff were divided along ideological logical lines, uh, those who supported and didn't support uh, the regime. And speaking about relocations, we are not going to cover like all these things, but just for you to understand their burdens, obstacles, and uh, problems that uh, um, displaced universities had to face. Yes, yeah, so, and these are only some of them, right? So like these are safety policies and uh, people had to advocate uh, advocate for their rights. Uh, we had some problems um, with how to arrange our activities, whether it is online or hybrid or in person. Uh, funding and salaries were the big issues and we still have some um, cases, I would say, that uh, separate uh, um, professors and academic staff and administration haven't received their salaries for August, November 2014 for this month. So, yeah, so there are still open cases. We had to take care about our students, about our infrastructure, because we definitely couldn't bring um, our laptops, uh, most of our books, uh, resources, uh, uh, not to mention laboratories, right? And uh, uh, gym equipment. So this stayed in those territories. Uh, um, we had to th think about our accreditation. So how we are going to accreditate now our uh, certificates and diplomas. Um, I will also put here, are we not in the same boat? Because, yeah, we were not in the same boat with local universities and uh, high educational establishments because we were kind of competitors for them. So there were now more and more burden to the cities, yes, yeah? so because we had to kind of spread the students and uh, um, try to, um, you know, like move them a little bit and also like squeeze into that academic environment in some local places. Um, and of course, emotional and physical conditions uh, of uh, um, many people were not uh, um, very stable. So we understand that uh, um, back in that days, in those days, many of us had poor housing conditions, lack of financial resources to satisfy basic needs, uh, which influenced, of course, our productivity and academic su success for some certain period of time. So again, as a teacher, we always move uh, our classes and our uh, participants to, uh, so to say, um, guided or individual uh, instructions, right? So um, again, if you're interested more about how the processes were taking on, if you're interested in their Minister of Education, I mean, uh, DPR and LPR, or their accreditation committee qualifications, so you can explore, yes, yeah, so you can uh, search online or you can ask us during QA session. Okay, I can lead and help, but we will not uh, go into detail right now. So, um, yeah, you may see that uh, propaganda worked uh, a lot and uh, we had to take care, first of all, of our diplomas because we understand that uh, if we um, have my case, Donetsk State University of Management, uh, like split and part of it stayed in Donetsk and part moved to Mariupol. So we, could, we can't have like 
to universities, right? So we need to re-register our activities. We need to, th to think about different uh, uh, issues, how we are going to issue our diplomas so that it will be eligible for our students. And of course, we had to always think about our next step. What are we going to do? And just for you to visualize how we relocated first to Mariupol, and this is how our classrooms, yeah, so our premises look like. Um, and if you see in this picture, and you might think that these are like focus groups working on some issue. No, that's not focus groups. So these are students with their professors working on different classes, like a history class at the back and the uh, math class. And these are like, you may see some of educators having their discussion because we literally, we didn't have rooms to uh, work. Um, that's why this is how um, the situation looked uh, for us. However, with the time we submitted grants, we received support and uh, sponsorship, and this is also a successful case for us now in 2022 about with that we will speak later but this is how we managed to end up uh, uh, by february 24 yeah so that was like a better thing for us um, so again coming back to our kind of a lesson plan we uh, educators very often give homework to our students right um, however now I even don't know how to call this because in Ukraine, I will explain in Ukraine when we mean homework, right? So we literally mean home. So students used to do their assignments at home and not many of them uh, have now their apartments. So many of them have lost everything. And as a teacher, I'm confused. So I would probably call it like an independent practice. And as an independent practice for all of us, I want to think about how you can help displaced universities, students, staff, and professors in 2022. So during today's short conversation from my side, yeah, we have touched upon some basics and a brief description from the events in 2014. But what are our lessons learned and how can we apply this eight year experience now? We are sure that we need to act, we need to support each other, we need to support researchers and students from Ukraine and who are now in Ukraine. It is clear that this war will be over one day, very soon we hope, and the Ukrainian science along with the whole country will require fresh starts. So that's why we need to keep in mind our short, mid and long term programs of different scales. And we believe that Ukrainian science will be successfully preserved, reloaded, and updated. Oh, and I almost uh, forgot about assessment. Of course, as a good teacher, we need to assess, right? So we need to do the assessment. And that is, assessment is how we grade our students and check how they accomplish their materials. Probably not today and not with this topic. It's difficult to assess who had more grief and who had more losses. But I believe it is like really hard to put grades in this case. So I assume it is better to leave it as a self-reflection part. As a self-reflection, I want everybody today during our conversation, during this hour, to think for a moment about what we all have done to support Ukraine and Ukrainians, what each of us has done to, to support students from Ukraine, what thoughts you have had for the past months and with emotions we all have experienced. For our international audience, I want you to remember that we Ukrainians win, and when we win, we will celebrate with the whole world. So at least everybody should learn today the phrase that is so important for us. And please um, remember it, drill this phrase, Slava Ukraini, repeat it several times, so we will remember it while triumphing our victory together. So Slava Ukraini. And I hope that now we will have broader perspectives and now we will have broader conversations about how we can support each other. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. And Liz, we have Liz back. Um, that was really interesting, Elena, very helpful. Um, 
Liz, before we kind of move into questions, I, I want to ask you two things. I want to ask you about um, um, your 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 brief, you know, the, the the experience you had when the war broke out and how you how you left and perhaps why you left. So, uh, I, I, um, why why you needed to leave? Because I know that you had a you have a, a, a specific reason you needed to leave. Um, and then perhaps moving into this idea of um, um, what you think the international university community can, can be can be doing. Thank you, Adam. My apologies for the technological issues on my end. Um, um, I hope uh, that you know uh, the audience that we're engaging with today. Um, can understand that um, of when, when the world has been discussing, you know, for months, uh, Russian troops at the Ukrainian border, for many people, um, including myself, this conversations meant not only analyzing it, but also having uh, an understanding of what is at stake for you. And uh, because my background, because of my background as a student activist, uh, and uh, because of my parents' uh, location in Eastern Ukraine, uh, I, I did realize quite clearly that it's not, it is not safe um, to stay unless you have a very clear way of helping on the ground. And as a scholar, I don't know how to hold a gun. So I do not really think that I would be helpful uh, to people on the ground. I don't want to be a burden because we all know that any civilian who is not fighting uh, who is a potential target will obviously be a burden to the military and to the um, various services that are trying to help uh, the uh, soldiers to win their fights. So uh, for those uh, of us who are not able to help uh, in, that, in any way on the ground, um, a decision to leave uh, was uh, the only choice that made sense at that point. And of course, uh, for those of us who've been very active in pro-democracy movements, uh, we have been always aware that we do have targets on our backs because uh, to say that we're not the most favored people in, for Russian government is not to say anything. Uh, and uh, we know from well, and also, you know, the media reports and the information that has been shared by the U.S. government that uh, there were uh, intentions by Russian military early on to make sure that uh, people who are particularly active are killed. And we've seen, unfortunately, from the reports of the atrocities that have been happening in Kiev regions that those kill lists are real and people were murdered for their pro-Ukrainian position. So I think that uh, in rationally balancing things out, uh, leaving has made more sense and uh, not not being in the middle of the fight was a way for me personally to be helpful uh, and not to be a burden. Um, and I also think that it's very important to remember that this war is really not only about the military action that is happening on the ground. Elena has mentioned several times that Russian propaganda and Russian disinformation campaigns are very powerful. And they're attempting to influence opinions around the world, not only in Ukraine or Russia. So we have to make sure that Ukrainians are not silenced and the world sees the truth. And one of the ways of doing exactly that is through helping Ukrainian students and scholars. And I will focus a little bit more on, on helping Ukrainian scholars because uh, this is what the Scholars at Risk has been involved with. And this is what we've been working with several other scholarly groups um, around the world, really. We have been uh, very grateful because we saw an enormous support internationally for Ukrainian students and scholars. Um, 
but there are some peculiarities of the war that is happening right now in Ukraine that we haven't really seen in other conflicts and we need to be aware of those. So I hope you can see my screen now. And um, just to give you a little bit of the sense of the current opportunities um, that are both out there and those opportunities that we really need. Um, these are, of course, some of the traditional fellowships and positions that have been already open. As I've mentioned, uh, you know, some of the Ukrainian scholars have been able to relocate, to leave the country, to settle safely outside in European uh, universities. Uh, however, what is different about this, this war compared to many other conflicts that we have seen is that most of Ukrainian scholars will not leave Ukraine. This is not a classical, you know, uh, people running away from the war zone situation. There are a number of reasons for it. Uh, some of the most important reasons are, of course, the fact that there are a lot of scholars who are, are in, involved in activities that are uh, ensuring security of the country. This is you know, a research related to defense, uh, research that ensures that nuclear plants in Ukraine are uh, secure because you have seen in the news reports that Russian troops have attacked nuclear nuclear plants. And of course, you cannot expect physicists or radiologists, scientists to leave because this is their job. There are a lot of scholars who are supporting other critical infrastructure objects and many who cannot leave because they're in the uh, specific age range um, for men who are between 18 to 60. Leaving uh, is uh, not mostly an option. So what Ukrainian scholars really need are more remote work opportunities. And uh, we have seen uh, some successful examples that I will share on the next slide. Uh, but we have to remember that over 80% of Ukrainian scholars are staying in Ukraine. And a lot of them are people whose universities have been shelled, who don't have labs or don't have classrooms to come back to. So they will really need these remote opportunities. Of course, there are also scholars like Olena herself who are in the United States um, who also will need hosting. And we should remember about this uh, people as well. Uh, they're already in the US. Not all of their programs will be able to sustain them if the conflict continues for several more months. So uh, this is another area about that needs to, uh, further engagement. And um, just like we're doing today, hosting webinars about Ukraine or lecture series uh, would also help quite significantly because, um, as I've mentioned, uh, there are a lot of stereotypes about Ukraine. There are a lot, there's a lot of disinformation. We know that for many people, uh, it's, uh, it's not that well known what is going on in the country and in the region more specifically. Um, so uh, these are, of course, incredibly important information uh, uh, events that need to take place in order for people to be able to learn about the war and what they can do to contribute to stopping it. Um, here are some examples of uh, the resources that can help you to learn a little bit more, and we can answer all the questions as we go. But of course, Scholars at Risk has, uh, a good, uh, has good resources to help guide you through creation of the op opportunities for Ukrainian scholars. Um, one of the example or non-residential fellowship uh, that is already running is was actually established by the Harvard Ukrainian Studies Institute and IWM, which is an, a nonprofit in Vienna. And they have created 17 non-residential fellowship, which exactly will support scholars inside Ukraine with those remote opportunities that they so desperately need. Similarly, the Open Society University Network has both residential and non-residential fellowships. And um, you can uh, also refer to the UA Science Reload Initiative, which is a group of Ukrainian scholars that are working specifically 
to help establish remote opportunities, help mentor Ukrainian scholars about getting access to these opportunities and uh, taking the most advantage of them. Um, I think to wrap it up, I just want to highlight that uh, I hope that we all learned today that uh, we we can do we can bring a change uh, by helping the scientists who unfortunately have been affected by war not to be silenced. That's the most important uh, contribution, and that's the most important request that they have right now. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Um, I, I think I've. Do you know the numbers and, and of how many academics currently are there? I think I've read up upwards of 100,000 or in the yes, higher education the community. Yeah. yeah, the total number of, high, of academics in Ukraine is uh, roughly at 100,000 people. And again, you know, we're talking about um, I, I can I can share a little bit later uh, with you. Uh, we are working on a large study with uh, the Ukrainian National Academy of Sciences, and from the current data, it looks like it's going to be roughly between thirteen to fifteen percent of scholars who will leave or who have left the country. And we're talking about about eighty five percent of scholars who will remain inside Ukraine. And. Before we get, we have a, uh, some questions starting to come in, but can you give us a sense of the Ukrainian education, like the, the you know, there, there's a, a system in terms of the, uh, where it placed, um, the, the, the history of it, the pride that, that, that goes uh, in there as well. Well, Ukrainian um, uh, higher education system in particular is very well integrated with the European higher education area. So it would look exactly what you would expect from a classic, as we like to call it, Bologna country. Uh, it's a three cycle system, which has a short cycle similar to associate's degree in the United States. And then, of course, when we're talking about scholars, scholars would have a research degree and equivalent to a PhD or a doctor of science which is a degree that has been inherited by Ukraine from the Soviet Union. Um, actually, I think what is important to acknowledge is that Ukraine is the second largest higher education system in the post-Soviet space. So Russia would be the largest higher education system, but Ukraine is the second largest. Uh, so we're talking about a million and a half students, again, over 100,000 uh, scholars, uh, and uh, about 350 institutions of higher education, meaning universities. Um, the, uh, the traditionally, of course, similarly to many other Soviet states, Ukrainian researchers in STEM and natural sciences uh, would be the most integrated into the global research community. And that's one of the things that we saw manifest itself because many of the positions that have been already open are positioned in STEM, uh, since those scholars have a lot of also connections globally. Um, for the social sciences and humanities, the situation is more challenging because as uh, many in the audience are probably well aware, um, the so social sciences did not start developing in the Soviet Union until its very late years. And uh, of course, uh, there's a much, much smaller level of integration. However, I think one of the important um, aspects to highlight is that with the Ukraine's integration with the European Union more generally from 2013 through the association agreement, Ukrainian scholars also became increasingly integrated. And uh, many of them have uh, everything starting with you know, sufficient language skill all the way to the uh, previous experience working with Western academia, either through the uh, North American projects or large European projects such as Erasmus Plus and Horizon 2020, uh, which are the flagship European Union uh, programs. I hope that answers your questions. If, if, if it does not, feel free to follow up at any point. Not very helpful. Um, we have a question that asks, as you know, are there any special forms of relationships between 
Ukrainian and Russian scientists at this point, um, both in exile um, and, and not. So I would say some general and maybe Liz will adapt to my answer. So I would say that before the first wave of the world, like before the 2014, I would say that we had common projects, we work together, I would speak for myself uh, personally. So we had uh, lots of collaborations and even exchange programs. Uh, so we had uh, common pub uh, publishing materials and uh, we could submit an article together with the colleagues from uh, universities in Moscow or St. Petersburg. Uh, um, so we, we had a communication with them and um, we were open for, like both uh, sides were open for collaboration. Again, I would speak my, from my experience and uh, what I saw around me. Again, I would repeat that I'm from Donetsk and we are like very close to the border, to Russia. So that's why communication and the time zones and uh, uh, physically we were closer to each other. So we, we had this partnership. Uh, however, we understand uh, for some some certain reasons, um, our um, uh, common projects, uh, our exchange programs, and all kinds of collaborations after 2014, of course, stopped. And I can't even imagine now um, organizing a conference together or, or submitting an article. So that would be hard because not always we have the same settings, not always we have the same perspectives and worldviews. So I think after 2014, the situation has changed um, radically. And now, nowadays, yes, after 21st of September, uh, sorry, sorry, February, of course, we understand that all kinds of partnerships would be, for me personally, even um, morally, uh, yeah, so from my beliefs, from my values, uh, impossible. So, as, so far, I, I don't see any uh, common grounds for us. And um, what we now advocating for is that Russian programs, Russian cooperation, cooperation with European universities, world universities with Russian professors uh, would be uh, terminated unless we uh, finish the war and unless we understand uh, uh, their position and um, if someone puts us in the same line and says that we have uh, the same uh, problems or we have the same worldviews, so I would probably ask those people not to do that. Uh, um, for lots of people, especially Ukrainians now, it is uh, um, something that we do not expect. Lisa, well, let I me ask you, there's a, yeah. a, a follow-up question, which I think is you know, right on track with what you're talking about, Elena, and for both of you, uh, from, the, from the, uh, somebody in the audience that says, why do you think a lot of international, including U.S. institutions, tend to put Ukrainian and Russian scholars under one, one umbrella? And uh, uh, she cites as an example, help to Ukrainian and Russian students, scholarships to Ukrainian and Russian students, et cetera. Do you think it somehow is connected to the fact um, of international communities not being able to accept the differences? I think I can uh, probably start answering and then Olana would add uh, what she feels uh, is missing from my answer. But um, I would probably refer here to uh, one of the uh, recent discussions that has very timely happened uh, in uh, Lviv uh, in Western Ukraine. Uh, and this discussion involved uh, a professor uh, of Oxford, uh, Federico Veresa, who I think has very um, clearly uh, put it that Unfortunately, after the fall of the Soviet Union, Moscow has not stopped being a center of the region to many scholars in the West. Unfortunately, despite the fact that Soviet Union has broke apart and there were 15 independent states, uh, in many cases, uh, 
the legacy or you know the narratives uh, of of the Soviet era persisted, and uh, Moscow meet, remained uh, in a sense. Uh, a, you know, a metropolis that a lot of scholars were looking uh, to to hear about the post-Soviet space, and um, because of this, you know, because of this increasing increasingly uh, developed ties between, I think, Western and Russian scholars, uh, and of course much smaller ties between Ukrainian and Western scholars, because first of all, Ukrainian higher education system is smaller. And secondly, uh, it's important to understand that Ukraine is a periphery inside of the semi-periphery, right? Because the post-Soviet space after 1991, as which has been written by many scholars, has become a sort of semi-periphery, much much less attention has been focused to it because the Cold War was over and it was not no longer a significant threat. And inside of that semi-periphery, Ukraine is another peripheral area, right, which was not really in the focus of much research. So um, Russian scholars have much more engagement with the West. And of course, a lot of Western colleagues, I think, have seen that uh, academic freedom has been diminishing in Russia, and uh, everybody have heard from the news about the extreme uh, punishment that uh, Russians will carry on if they call things for what they are, if they call out the war in Ukraine. And the, it has created to me a sense that um, in academia, at least, it has created a sense that um, Russian scholars are also under a threat, which I do not necessarily disagree with. I know there are Russian scholars who have been consistently critical of their government who are a threat. Um, but I think that's what, what has been has escaped the attention of many Western uh, researchers and institutions is that the threat to Ukrainian scholars is not comparable to the threat that Russian scholars are facing at this point. And I think that uh, because of this Soviet legacy and because of, you know, the, the narratives that are putting Moscow in the center of the region, uh, a lot of institutions uh, miss out on the fact that uh, it is... Uh, unfortunately quite discriminative, I, I think, uh, to compare the challenges faced by Ukrainian people with those faced by Russians. Um, so uh, I guess that's a very complicated and maybe not quite straightforward answer to the question that we have received. Uh, but I do hope it gives a little bit of a sense of uh, you know the the background of the relationship that are being uh, that have been built for decades that we have to be aware of uh, when we are discussing situations that are happening right now. And for either of you, do you worry that when you hear that grouping that it is inadvertently playing into the propaganda of the of Ukrainian and Russian people being the same um, and, and being part of the same system, so to speak. And, and here, and... I wouldn't, uh, well, I, I, I think you're right that it definitely does play into the propaganda uh, that is being uh, spread by Russian government. Um, but I think what is also important to acknowledge is that when that grouping happens, Ukrainians are automatically put in a disadvantaged position because uh, for a Ukrainian scholar to take advantage of an opportunity abroad, if they're not already in broad, they need to be applying for you know, scholarships, fellowships, positions from bomb shelters. And this is not the same that what you know many russian scholars do and even those who are a threat they are you know in a danger but they're in their own apartment with their laptop uh which uh essentially i think we have to admit um 
the, the danger in this programs that put Ukrainians and Russian together is that there is a much higher chance that Russian scholars will take advantage of these opportunities. And uh, unfortunately, we have been um, hearing of, uh, let's just, well, let's say people who are interested in, you know, uh, speaking out against war uh, for once so that they can move somewhere into the West, right? Because uh, there is um, you know, there is a narrative inside the Russian federations that uh, West is kind of foolish and you can just pretend to be against the war and take advantage of all of those opportunities that are being proposed to Russian dissidents. So I think everybody has to be also very careful with the fact that there are people who uh, want to take advantage of uh, the uh, positive intentions of Western academia to support Russian scholars who are actually at risk. And we may, uh, we should understand that education is what. So when some people sometimes say that culture and education um, have nothing to do with politics and um, regime of the government. So I think that uh, people do not uh, share with us all their ideas and they, they are not honest because education is influenced by politics. Yes. And while Ukrainian... Uh, scholars, uh, Ukrainian students um, somewhere in the bombshells uh, trying to continue their activities, still trying to work, trying to support each other. So some um, Russian um, uh, people, uh, people from academia, yes, so can benefit uh, um, and can take advantage of the US government-sponsored opportunities for the purpose of promoting Russian, Russian disinformation, right, and enabling the Russian government to fuel the war, right, so which is something that we definitely don't want, uh, we Ukrainians, I mean, yeah, and I hope that uh, people around the world will support uh, that. So that's why um, all these indifferences that we have and and uh, uh, situations uh, in which we are now, of course, uh, um, only um, creates uh, this balance. And that's why um, not to probably um, give uh, people more opportunities and uh, for one people, for Russians, take more opportunities and take our opportunities for Ukrainian students and scholars uh, participating in uh, programs. Uh, yeah. And I even not to mention participation in the programs, just continue their everyday activities, working in labs, um, doing the research. So I think it's very unfair to provide now um, funding or support or um, any other kind of exchange programs uh, to those who started the war and uh, uh, can spread the disinformation outside Russia in the world to the world community, right? So around the world. So that's why for this purpose, uh, uh, I think those programs have to be terminated. We have a question from um, somebody who's uh, saying that her university is considering starting a Ukrainian language program for the first time. However, they are concerned about um, gather, garnering, garnering enough interest from students. Um, what would you say to a university administrator about why a Ukrainian language program is worth their time, energy, and resources? Um, you know, and she says that some might argue, for example, that Russian language will get you far enough in Ukraine. What? 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 How can you help this argument? What would you? What would you say? I think there are a couple of things that you could really uh, argue uh, in this situation because, uh, first of all, from an academic perspective, uh, I think uh, supporting the idea that Russian language, which has been weaponized by Russian government to inflict war on other countries, and this is not only Ukraine, right, because uh, 
in addition to the war that has been going on in Ukraine since 2014, where the narrative was about protecting some Russian speakers, uh, very similar uh, arguments have been used when Russian armies have uh, invaded Georgia in 2008. Uh, Russian government is using the same narrative when they're keeping their military in Transnistria, in Moldova, right? So we have to understand that promoting the idea that uh, Russian is a regional language that will get you uh, enough understanding is also su supporting uh, weaponization of the language. Uh, and it is uh, really an imperial narrative that Russia has systematically invested into promoting, um, I think at this point for centuries probably, right? Because uh, forceful uh, Russification, as we call it, um, has been happening in the region since uh, 1700s, basically. Uh, so people were forcefully deprived the opportunities to speak their local languages by Russian empire and continuing to support this narrative is really a support for an imperial narrative. Uh, the second ar argument I think that you could make uh, is that there are Ukrainian language programs in North American universities and they're quite successful. So for a university administration that wants to start a language pro program like that, uh, I would suggest learning from the great experiences that, that there are. Uh, university of Kansas and Lawrence has a great Ukrainian language program. University of Washington is another example. I believe University of Pennsylvania is uh, also has a language program. So so uh, look out to those uh, fantastic examples that already exist in the United States and learn from their experiences because uh, they have been obviously able to prove that there is enough sustainable interest to maintain programs like this. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, I just wanted to add very yeah. quick. So probably it's now high time to change the... Uh, conditions and to have new reality yeah so and to have new opportunities and to have new norms right so um, and ukrainian language ukrainian culture and values can be the attribute to uh, a good change and a good start for something new we all know that after conflicts after the wars we have new humor we have new culture we have new music we have new everything yes it will affect all spheres right and it already has been affecting we already have new uh, new intentions new initiatives and uh, ukraine now is kind of a brand I don't really like this, but but we may understand, yeah. So, like, it's now something new wave, um, and why not to uh, change something that uh, has been stable for a long time? So that's a good opportunity to turn it like a flipping point, and um, yeah, I think that it's uh, for for uh, global perspective a good chance uh, to update uh, uh, the context and the agenda. Well said. Um, I, I, being mindful of the, of the time, I want to just ask both of you one closing question. Um, and um, when when the three of us spoke before, I, you know, Elena, for example, you were telling me that you're apartment doesn't really exist anymore in Maripol. Your university doesn't exist. You, you've been through this, Liz. I'm sure you're watching television or being in touch with people and, and seeing places that, that, that were once so familiar to you, um, having no resemblance to, to, to how you um, understand them or, or remember them. But my question is, what, what, I mean, Elena, you got to it a little bit in the last question, but but what is giving you hope through this? Because it, it, it you know, it, it would seem so hopeless and so devastating. What, what, when you do look at this and know all these, what, where is your hope? And, and what, and, and, and what, and what, what, it, what, you know, inspire maybe us as well. 
So I would say, if I may, yes, because I'm more like for emotional uh, part today and this for more for academia, right, <laughs> today, and she can probably give some more facts. But for me, uh, the situation this is happening now and losing my apartment and uh, um, my university is now relocating, my second university is now relocating again, um, it's not a new situation because this scenario I remember from 2014, we already experienced that uh, eight years ago when I lost my apartment when I had to move to another place that everything from scratch, it was a completely new chapter in my life book and university was relocated and we start again from nothing. Uh, almost, I mean, we only had our people resources, yeah, so we only had our skills and then you saw the pictures, yeah, so we moved from where to where. So that's why for me, it's like kind of a deja vu and familiar, um, I, again, path now. Uh, of course, the scale uh, of atrocity is uh, much bigger now, and we can compare probably, but still, we kind of understand that even in a desperate time, so education will be a key for us. Education is something that will support us and um, will give us um, directions on how to act and to rebuild rebuild, restore, uh, reunite people. And if we as a team, as, as Ukrainians, uh, manage to do that, so we will be really a close-knit community, which is happening now. So again, um, we managed to um, start a university uh, submit grants, um, uh, invite speakers, uh, raise the people's awareness around the world uh, back in 2014. So what we are doing now is just we are adapting and uh, working probably on a bigger scale, but we understand that it's not the end and we will never surrender. We will never give up. Um, we know that when we win, we will continue our activities. Yeah, that's a lot to do. A lot, a lot of things that we need to collect and start from again, uh, start developing. So now for academia, it's a kind of a step back. We understand that we, um, as um, um, scientists. Uh, terminate sometimes our activities. We can't work uh, uh, fully immersed and dive into our projects uh, and to our research. But we, on another hand, understand that in the nearest future, we will come back and we will have even more desire, more power, because we want um, the whole world community to understand that Ukraine, it's not part of Russia. Ukraine is not part of anything. Ukraine is an independent country with its mentality, with its values, with its academic um, spice. You, you know, like we have our um, activities and we available resource and the world community can benefit from collaboration with us. Uh, uh, and it's a mutual process, of course. So... We, we we know that uh, we can give the world uh, lots of good ideas, uh, projects, and uh, opportunities for cooperation and collaboration. And of course, our smart students who have uh, experienced uh, um, the, the war in their lives, so they will uh, become a new breed of uh, smart, intelligent, uh, resilient, and sustainable people. I don't want to take up too much time, but I think uh, uh, one thing that is worth mentioning is that, uh, as we've discussed throughout this hour, uh, the war in, in Ukraine today is of, on a scale that hasn't been seen uh, in Europe for so many decades. But uh, what is happening in Ukraine today, I think uh, we have to admit is a logical uh, continuation of Russian policy towards the former Soviet states uh, that has emerged in early 90s and continued throughout uh, the last 30 years. Uh, what makes me hopeful about the situation in Ukraine is that when Russia attacked, it didn't just face the Ukrainian army. 
What we see in Ukraine is a 40 million people resistance because every single person has been has started their own fight. Uh, there are soldiers who are fighting on front lines. There are volunteers who are fighting to help them to get the necessary resources. There are people who are protesting in Russian-occupied cities every single day, despite uh, the very high risk of just being shot on the spot. Um, and I know that uh, in the West, we hear quite a bit about uh, oftenly, you know, very brave people protesting in Russia, but we might hear much less about people of Kherson who go out every single day on their squares and uh, who literally stop Russian tanks with their bare hands. Um, I think uh, what we see right now is really a renaissance of Ukrainian nation uh, because uh, Ukrainians have been attempting to gain independence from Russia for several centuries and we finally got it 30 years ago. So we're not giving it back. Uh, the, of course, there is a danger that this is going to be another executed renaissance, which is um, what happened during the Soviet Union, when many of the Ukrainian scholars and artists have been murdered uh, because of their opposition to the Soviet government. Uh, but I hope that uh, the opposition of 40 million people is so much stronger than any army that Russian government could potentially put together. And I know that as long as we ensure that there is support, that there is platforms like the one that we're fortunate to have today where Ukrainian people uh, can speak up and can be heard, uh, I think that will ensure that we succeed. Thank you. I, I want to, before I hand it to Claire to, to close out, I want to read it. There was a comment um, that was, it came through the Q&A as really as a reflection more than a question. Uh, it says an, an appeal. Uh, and she writes, I am from the Academy of Fine Arts in Krakow, Poland. We have 70 students and 12 scholars from many cities to Ukraine. And every day is more and more people in need. We help in continuation of study, pay the scholarships, care about dinners and accommodation. We need solidarity of international universities and schools to provide further long-term help for Ukrainian students and scholars. It is a huge problem. Maybe you can think, ask in your institutions for special scholarships, funds directly for Ukrainian students, scholars, refugees at universities in Poland. It is very important. We need solidarity of international university environment. We need solidarity of the international university environment. We look from 50 days at the immensity of human tragedy. Thank you all the best for panelists and everyone. I, I'm certain you would both uh, uh, agree with that uh, um, in, 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 all, um, in, all its, um, in all its points. So Claire, I will hand it to you. Thank you, Adam. Uh, and Thank you, Liz and Elena. I just, I just have to say that hearing your personal experiences, even those that I had heard previously, just underlines for me the importance of our helping our higher education colleagues who are impacted by the war. So thank you for your powerful words. Um, thank you to Roger Williams as well for hosting this conversation and to all of you for joining us. Um, my apologies, as it seems we weren't able to make it through all of the questions in the Q&A, uh, but we will pass those along to the panelists um, for response, and hopefully we'll get back to you. Um, Scholars at Risk has been mentioned throughout this conversation, and I am Advocacy Director at Scholars at Risk. Um, as many of you may know, uh, Scholars at Risk is an international network of higher education institutions committed to protecting the freedom to think, question, and share ideas. We do this in part through arranging temporary positions of academic refuge for scholars facing threats to their lives. And since the war in Ukraine began, we have seen a surge in applications uh, from scholars impacted by the war. Uh, so to close, I would like to invite 
um, higher education community members who are a, who have joined us today to join Scholars at Risk in uh, creating positions for scholars impacted by the war in Ukraine. Uh, I think Liz, you said it best uh, earlier this evening when you said we can bring about change by helping scientists impacted by the war to not be silenced. Thank you all. <laughs>